for us to be our own fund managers. Soon we will have personalized individual drugs. Everything is being individualized. An open society requires an open architecture. Pick up a piece of paper and write down two words, open and transparent engrave them in your minds. Work against openness and transparency at your own peril. You see, not that long ago, about a year ago, the Scandinavian subsidiary of a large U.S. multinational corporation received a fax from headquarters. Despite the harsh Scandinavian winter, the subsidiary was to be honored by a visit from one of the top people at the corporation. Attached to the facts was a list, a list of requirements. The company star wanted a number of things. This is what she wanted. She wanted a hotel room with white wallpaper, white roses, white lilies, white uh, tablecloths, white curtains, white candles, white sofas, a CD player, and a collection of Latin and R&B artists a VCR, mineral water, Evian exclusively, of course, as always. Snapples, but only lemon, raspberry, and iced tea. A makeup table, plenty of fruit, but only mango, papaya, green grapes, without seeds, <laughs> needless to say. Honey mellow, watermelon, chocolate chip cookies, brownies, and she would just die for some vanilla ice cream. Now, who can demand such things? Let me tell you who the demanding hotel guest was. It was no other than Jennifer Lopez, J-Lo. R&B, Latino, pop music, diva, movie star extraordinaire. Now free your mind of Miss Lopez's fondness for ice cream in the winter and ponder this. What would you do if someone at your company, the top designer, the whisked programmer, the star salesperson sent you a list which looked like that. Perhaps today some of them already do. Tomorrow, in all likelihood, some of them will. If not, there is a clear risk that you recruited the wrong people. You see, collectivism in all its many forms, political communism, homogeneous national cultures, monolithic organizations, collectivism in all its many forms is now challenged. We're jumping, and we're jumping straight into a world of man and markets, a world with endless individual choice and information mania. And this is absolutely crucial to get, because you see, information, by and large, determines the most efficient way to organize business activities. Now, business economics isn't rocket science. In fact, it's more like pocket science. Business and economics is very similar to meteorology. I mean, think about it. Weather, climate, temperature determines in a proper distinct way was it is efficient to wear. I mean, you could walk around in shorts here in Copenhagen today, but it sort of wouldn't make sense. You can wear a fur coat when you go to Hawaii, but it wouldn't make sense. In a similar manner, information and the availability of information determines how we organize business activities. When there is an abundance of information, we build marketplaces, bazaars. When information is scarce, we build hierarchies, companies, pyramids. And you see, what has happened during the last 15 to 20 years is that we have moved from a world which could be characterized as an information desert into a world of information mania, an information jungle. Right now, we are witnessing the equivalent of global warming in economics and business. Markets are beginning to destroy hierarchies all over the place. We're being pushed into a world of market mania. Today, we see more markets for more things covering a larger geographical area than ever before. Still, 
I claim we ain't seen nothing yet. Right now, about 20% of world output is open to global competition. In 30 years' time, research suggests that we're going to look at 80%. This is a mere tea party in comparison with what will come. Now let's take a somewhat closer look at these markets and try to understand what it takes to be successful in a world of individual choice and market mania. These are markets, markets quite often characterized by overcapacity. Supply is greater than demand. And this is a new phenomenon. This wasn't the case 20 years ago. The automotive industry, the electronics industry, bulk chemicals, everywhere we look, overcapacity. Why? Global competition but also information technology. Information technology, you see, is great for productivity. And of course, productivity is desirable on the level of a single firm. But when all companies in an industry push for the productivity frontier, the result is, of course, overcapacity. And now we have arrived. This is a surplus society, an excess economy, an age of abundance, but it is an excess economy with a surplus of sellers. Commoditization days are here. Unfortunately, the typical company, the typical product, the typical service is so similar to all its competitors that you need a magnifying glass to tell the difference. And on top of that, the information available to us as consumers today is becoming increasingly inexpensive. Using an intelligent search engine on the web, you can easily shave off $500, $600, $700 if you're buying a home theater system. And the search will take you two minutes. You see, the internet is becoming for the chopping generation of today what the pill was to the love generation of the 1960s. It allows us to be somewhat more promiscuous, right? We can shop around without any side effects. Well, maybe we're gonna get a mouse arm or something like that. But in general, you see, we can scan a global market. We're no longer restricted to a local market. Now, let's add these things up. Market mania, surplus supply, continuous commoditization, increasingly inexpensive information, and there is but one conclusion that can be drawn. We're being pushed into a world of increasingly perfect markets. We're being pushed into a bazaar. And you guys, you all know how a bazaar works, right? I mean, many of you have been to a bazaar. You walk into a bazaar and you're in the market for tomatoes. And in this particular bazaar, there are something like 698 different vendors trying to sell you tomatoes. And all the tomatoes look the same, all the tomatoes taste the same, so what do you do? You begin to bargain. It's five, four, three, two, one, zero. We're beginning to give away tomatoes, hoping to make it up on the oranges. I mean, just look at what is happening to mobile phone operators. They will give you the phone for free. Sign here, two years, you can have it. You see, in a bazaar, in a bazaar, power is transferred. It's transferred from the producers to the consumers. And the stupid, humble, loyal customer becomes a thing of the past. It will become much more difficult for any company in any industry in any part of the world to make money in the years to come. <laughs> we shouldn't be surprised. In fact, it is not my idea. It was a colleague of mine. A Scottish colleague of mine who came up with the idea, Mr. Adam Smith. He wrote about it in 1776. You see, the number one characteristic of a well-functioning market, said Adam Smith, happens to be low average profitability. 
high profits we find in countries, in markets, that are teetering on the abyss, where competition is broken down, margins will become salami thin in most industries. And in light of that fact, I guess we shouldn't be overly surprised by the fact that capitalists are indeed crying these days. Now, it's been a pretty steep downhill since March 10, 2000, when the Nasdaq Composite Index hit an all-time high. I mean, we've seen some correction in the market during 2003, but still, it's been a 75% downward spiral in many cases. And while information technology, of course, will continue to create great opportunities for uh, developing businesses in innovative ways, from a strictly economic point of view, you see, information technology in general, and the net in particular, is probably best thought of as profit enemy number one. Information is to an economy what oil is to a machine, it's a lubricant. It makes the machine more efficient. And the more efficient it gets, the lower the average profitability we should expect. So, how do you make money in such a world? Well, it's really quite simple, folks. There is but one way in which you can make money in a well-functioning market economy. Making money is a question of developing and implementing an absolutely unique little recipe. Competition in this day and age is recipe-based for the simple reason that most technologies, most raw materials, most insights are available not only to us, but also to all other companies, more or less, throughout the world. This little recipe of ours, over time, needs to give rise to a temporary monopoly. For a short moment in time or space, we must be unique, the only one. And look at Microsoft. It's a great case in point. Rock solid temporary monopoly. I mean, that's why Microsoft needs to spend so much time in court. In fact, a few of you should probably spend some more time with a judge. It's a sign of success in this day and age. And this search for monopolies, it's not something that is restricted to the business community, I promise you. It goes on everywhere, in any walk of life. No, my name is Michael Jackson! I'm the only one who can sing with an extremely high-pitched voice and moonwalk simultaneously. Temporary monopoly, world famous, loads of money. Now I'm a painter. My name is Pablo Picasso. I make paintings of people who look like this. You see, the same principle, temporary monopoly, world famous. And behind these monopolies, we always find an innovation of some sort, of some kind. The ability of an individual or a group of individuals to think a thought that no one else has thought before, to implement an idea, a concept that no one else has successfully implemented in the history of business. In fact, in a world of perfect markets, it is the task of companies to create market imperfections. Imperfections are the only thing that will give us above average returns. And historically, of course, many of these innovations, these imperfections, were of a technological nature. 